Hi booktube, I'm here with a different kind of video. Uh, in this video I'm going to be reading an essay, uh, so I completely understand if you don't want to listen to me drone on in academic tones for a while. Um, this is an essay I wrote for university, I was taking a course on James Joyce. Um, so this is about Ulysses, the chaos theory, and homosocial desire. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to get right into it, um, because everything is explained in the essay. So I entitled this Method in the Madness, the Chaos Theory and Homosocial Desire in Joyce's Eumaeus. Um, Eumaeus is a specific chapter in Ulysses. That was the directive of the professor to choose just one chapter. But it's applicable to the whole thing, but I concentrated on one chapter. <laughs> okay. The mathematical reckoning of the chaos theory suggests determining a pattern from seemingly random data. A reader approaching Ulysses struggles, much like the mathematician, to create meaning from the sporadic text. Underlying Ulysses is an intricate structure ordered by the Lenati schema, intertextual allusions, and the scaffolding of Homer's Odyssey. It is with the help of these subcurrent patterns that a reader is able to determine the stratified ingenuity of the text. The chaos theory deserves an expanded explanation. According to Thomas Jackson Rice, the chaos theory is a stochastic, random behavior occurring in a deterministic system, or, in the words of Stephen Daedalus, a conscious, rational reagent between a ma micro and macrocosm ineluctably constructed upon the incertitude of the void. A key element of this theory is the importance given to the trivial. Objects that appear to have no meaning at first actually have significant implications. In Ulysses, some of the simplest objects or words are imbued with great meaning. Another way to trace the text of Ulysses is to apply the structure of homosocial relations against the chaos. Homosocial may be loosely defined as male bonding through means such as violence, shared women, and homosexuality. Beginning in Dubliners, the theme of homosociality is strongly evident throughout all of Joyce's works, and Ulysses is not an exception. Eumaeus is an intensely homosocial chapter. The scene is set in the cabin's shelter, which appears to be an exclusively male environment. Jennifer Levine describes this scene as men, many men, talk. The relationship that emerges to the forefront of the chapter is the one forged between Stephen Daedalus and Leopold Bloom. Their relationship, newly formed, is mutually beneficial or symbiotic. It has been commonly argued that Bloom is in search of a son, Stephen a father, and they find what they are looking for in each other. By applying the chaos theory to the homosocial bond between Bloom and Stephen, it is possible to determine that despite, or rather because of, their initial differences, they form a unique symbiotic relationship which results in redemption for both characters. National identity, the Laconian gaze, and sexuality all contribute to this interpretation of Eumaeus. The questions of nationality and race seem to be a primary concern to Joyce. In both a portrait of the artist as a young man and Ulysses, the main characters ruminate over what it means to be Irish, whether to proclaim pride as an Irishman, as Bloom does, or to question the sanctity of nationhood like Stephen. In accordance with their affirmation or negation, one can apply the scientific theory of centripetal and centrifugal forces to Bloom and Stephen. The Oxford English Dictionary <laughs> defines centripetal as tending towards the center, and centrifugal as tending to fly off from the center. Bloom, according to these definitions, is a centripetal character, constantly seeking his path homeward, and Stephen his opposite, imposing himself in exile. These labels are correctly placed as evidenced in Ithaca when the question is asked, how did the centripetal remainer, Bloom, afford egress to the centrifugal departer, Stephen? According to Newton's laws of physics, centripetal and centrifugal forces are symbiotic. In order to form a circle, one needs to draw items inwards using the centripetal force, such as gravity pulling the planets towards the sun, and a centrifugal force which is required to balance the centripetal. The centrifugal force is what keeps the planets from colliding with the sun. The interaction between these two forces fulfills Newton's law that to, that to every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. According to Newton, the forces have to be equal but opposite, which is applicable through the chaos theory. The system seems chaotic, but is actually highly structured when examined closer. Prior to Eumaeus, Stephen and Bloom 
were unable to form this bond because they were not equal forces. Stephen was already a fully developed character from Joyce's previous work, but Bloom was still an infant compared to him and Ulysses. Before Bloom's chance meeting with Stephen, Bloom did not have the capacity to attract people towards him. He ran away from homosocial bonding in Cyclops and was excluded from the homosocial outing in Aeolus. When Stephen and Bloom finally meet satisfactorily, it is or orchestrated by coincidence or ordered chaos. The narration slips into Bloom's mind as he thinks, If I hadn't heard about Mrs. Bufoy Purefoy, I wouldn't have gone and wouldn't have met. By chance, Bloom meets Stephen and Circe, and it is not until Eumaeus that Bloom asserts his attraction and determinedly snatches at Stephen, luring him inwards with his centripetal, with his centripetal force. The attraction is reciprocated by both parties. We are told that the queer suddenly things he popped out with attracted the older man. Later, Stephen is described as being attracted to Bloom. Bloom, who attracted Stephen's gaze. As Zoe and Bella read the poems of Stephen and Bloom and Circe, they confirm this homosocial attraction of the centripetal and centrifugal. Zoe notes that Stephen has woman's hands, and Bella claims that Bloom's hands are for the woman. Their centripetal and centrifugal forces are finally equalized at the end of the chapter as the two men walk off arm in arm. As Bloom and Stephen coupled arm and arm walk, they are observed by a driver having a tete-a-tete. -tete. One can assume that during this conversation that they make eye contact. It is the contact or gaze that interests the philosophy of Jacques Lacan. The Lacanian gaze determines our existence. We exist only because others can see that we exist. The confirmation of ourself is found in the other. Sheldon Brivik explains that the gaze is founded in a desire. He writes, One's perceptions must be motivated by being drawn towards its objects by desire, and desire is always based on an imagined response. The gaze in Eumaeus is a representation of the homosocial desire that Stephen and Bloom feel for each other. Their gaze can be traced in three phases. First, in Circe, they are gazing in opposite directions. Followed in Eumaeus, they stare at each other. And finally, in Ithaca, they both stare at Molly, uniting their homosexual bonds through her. The first time the gaze is encountered between Stephen and Bloom, they are looking in opposite directions. Stephen prone breathes to the stars, and Bloom and Gloom looms down. At this point, there is no homosexual bond, but the chaos theory is evident here, because of the coincidence of the opposing gazes occurring at the same time. In the Eumaeus episode, it is observed that both occurrences happen at the same time. This coincidence and opposition does not work to divide Bloom and Stephen, but rather to unite them. As Brivich writes, Bloom's system of seeing is parallel to Stephen's, parallel despite differences, so serious that the two systems can be described as moving in opposite directions. When their gazes meet in Eumaeus, Bloom and Stephen finally confirm each other's existence, and thereby confirm their homosocial desire for one another. The narrator describes Bloom and Stephen in terms of the gaze and chaos. It explains, Though they didn't see eye to eye in everything, a certain analogy there somehow was, as if both their minds were traveling, so to speak, in one train of thought. The connection or desire between the two are conveyed in a chaotic sense of opposites working together to create a whole. It is, this, it is the way through which their eye contact with one another is used as communication that the chaos theory is further demonstrated. For example, when they engage in eye contact, it appears random, but their gazes contain significant implications. Their gazes are described as meaningful in the Eumaeus chapter. Mr. Bloom and Stephen, each in his own particular way, both instinctively exchanged meaningful glances. Their homosocial communication is translated through their gaze when they look at each other. Bloom and Stephen share a bond that enables messages to be conveyed through their eyes. Bloom is described as giving Stephen a long, you are wrong gaze. Their homosexual bond is only beginning to form through gazes in Eumaeus as they look at each other, but it is further constructed through the gaze of a photograph. Part of the homosocial, as laid out by Eve Sedgwick, involves the homosocial triangle, wherein two men are able to bond over a shared woman. The Stephen Bloom Molly triangle begins to form in Eumaeus, as Bloom shares a photograph of Molly with Stephen. 
The picture is described as staring at Stephen, thereby unifying the homosocial relationship between him and Bloom. She acknowledges the existence of Stephen with her gaze, which opens a dialogue between the threesome. The narrative describes how the lady's eyes, dark, large, looked at Stephen. The homosocial bond is consummated in Ithaca, as Bloom and Stephen, by chaotic coincidence, both gaze at Molly's figure in the window while urinating. Their gazes, first Bloom's, then Stephen's, elevated to the projected luminous and semi-luminous shadow. This coincidence seems minutely insignificant, but a closer examination shows that although their genitalia are hidden from each other, they are united in a homosocial sexual act as they gaze at Molly. Thus, the three phases of gazing confirm the application of the chaos theory and the joining of their homosocial bond. This homosocial bond created through a shared woman is further solidified through the examination of sexuality. In Between Men, Sedgwick, argue, Sedgwick argues that the homosocial is both homophobic and homosexual. Colleen Lamos also links homosocial relations to homosexuality, arguing that the homosocial triangle enables a man to express his homosexual wish to share his wife with other men. The two terms are inseparable, according to Sedgwick. The triangular pattern in the homosocial, however, is not limited to two men and a woman. The homosexual aspect is amplified by a triangular desire between three men. This is found in Eumaeus when the homosocial triangle of desire is shaped by Bloom, Stephen, and the sailor Murphy. This is expressed in three ways that coincide with the chaos theory of randomness containing order, sporadic illusions, maddening masochism, and opposing bodily sentiments. According to Jennifer Levine, Eumaeus is underscored by a web of homoerotic illusions, such as Boyden having an analogy to any part of the body or indeed any object that has a spherical or sausage-like shape. One of the illusions that seems the strongest and least explicable is the number 16. Eumaeus is the 16th chapter. Ulysses occurs on the 16th day of June, and that number is tattooed on the chest of Murphy. In his extensive annotations, Gifford claims that in European slang and numerology, the number 16 meant homosexuality. This is fitting, seeing as it is implied that Murphy was engaged in a homosexual relationship with Antonio. The number not only alludes to Murphy's own homosexuality, but to a possibility of a desire surpassing the regular bonds of homosocial interaction between Stephen and Bloom. 16, when examined under the chaos theory, holds much more significance than first implied. Stephen muses on how he is united with Bloom in relation to the number 16 in the previous episode. He says, C moves to one great goal. I am 22 too. 16 years ago, I 22 tumbled 22 years ago. He 16 fell off his hobby horse. Once again, Joyce astounds the reader in the intricacy of order in the seemingly chaotic Ulysses by weaving the number 16 in vitally important places throughout the text. Another apparently unimportant intertextual illusion that possibly signifies a homosexual bond between Bloom and Stephen is yet another tattoo on Murphy. Murphy's implied lover, Antonio, is tattooed on his chest near the number 16. The tattoo is described as a young man's side face looking frowningly rather. There does not seem to be significant implications in the way the portrait is facing until it is once more alluded to later on in the chapter where Bloom looks sideways in a friendly fashion at the side face of Stephen. The hyper-homosexual homosocial triangle between Bloom, Stephen, and Murphy is made even more implicit in these, seemingly co in these seeming coincidences disguised as intertextual illusions. Just as Murphy mediates the relationship between Bloom and Stephen, so does Molly lubricate Bloom's relationship with other men. Now, Bloom can be described as a masochistic voyeur, deriving pleasure from the pain of being cuckolded. In Circe, he imagines Boylan inviting him to watch him and Molly. Boylan, to Bloom, over his shoulder, you can apply your eye to the keyhole and play with yourself while I just go through her a few times. To which Bloom replies, thank you sir, I will sir. Bloom actively seeks out Stephen to form a homosocial triangle. In Eumaeus, he shows Stephen a soiled photo of a large lady with her fleshy charms on evidence in an open fashion. He leaves the likeness there for a few minutes to speak for itself on the plea he so that the other could drink in the beauty for himself. 
Bloom watches as he thinks Stephen is deriving pleasure from his wife, a perfect ideal of the homosocial bond. According to Lamos, the simple action oversteps the homosocial into the homosexual. She believes that Bloom seduces Stephen and induces Stephen to come home with him. The picture's implications do not seem immensely important until the chaos theory is applied, and it is seen that it is through this masochistic action that unites Bloom and Stephen. As David Cotter writes, the jumps between Stephen and Bloom are affected through the themes of masochism. In Sue C, Bloom is accused of being bisexually abnormal. It's a direct quote from Joyce. Implying further that a homosexual relationship sought through Stephen is a possibility. Bloom suffers from satyriasis, a male obsession with sex. He admits to this obsession in Circe. It overpowers me, the warm impress of her warm form, even to sit where a woman has sat, especially with divaricated thighs. Bloom embraces the body and finds pleasure in it. Stephen is his opposite. In a portrait of the artist's young man, Stephen rejects the body and becomes an androgynous character. This makes Stephen a difficult target for Bloom's desire, but is already traced through the Lacanian gaze and the homosocial triangle, it seems that Stephen becomes acquiescent to Bloom. Cotter explains a fluctuation between extremes in regards to bodily affirmation and negation between Bloom and Stephen. He writes, Bloom's love of the bodily and his longing for the relinquishment of self-mastery are as much an aspect of Joyce as Stephen's loathing of body and his desire to be free of all bonds, to fly above the watery excretions of dung-clotted bodily existence. The two diverse paths of Stephen Daedalus and Leopold Bloom converge in this chaotic homosocial unity of bodily love and bodily hatred. In Hamlet, Polyonius observed Hamlet notes. Oh, in Hamlet, Polyonius, observing Hamlet, notes that, though this be madness, yet there is method in it. Ulysses is scattered throughout with allusions to Hamlet, and seemingly the text is ordered upon the notion of method and madness, or what may be called the chaos theory. In chaos theory, that which seems trivial or opposite is actually significant and similar. Order is an undercurrent of the seemingly chaotic. In Eumaeus, Joyce uses the trivial and different but similar to create a homosocial bond between Stephen and Bloom. David Heyman, trying to derive the mechanics of meaning in Ulysses, writes, Bloom and Stephen, by nature and or nurture, exiles and opposites, are emotional father and son, but each needs the other in himself far more than in the flesh. And according to Elliot B. Ghost Jr., the extremes of free will and determinism meet, contraries coincide, and opposites turn out to be identical in Joyce's novel. These two quotations sum up the relationship between the chaos theory and homosocial relationship in Eumaeus. Ultimately, both Stephen and Bloom are redeemed, as their two divergent paths intertwine, uniting the opposites through such trivial elements such as illusions, coincidences illuminating the homosocial bond between Stephen and Bloom, as seen in their national identity, the Lacanian gaze, and homosexuality. By the end of the novel, each redeems the other as it is through Stephen that Bloom can safely return home, and through Bloom that Stephen can return to exile. Um, yeah, that's my essay. Uh, I know, quite a strange uh, video, but I thought I'd share anyways. Thank you.